Our team works on the intersection of weather, climate, and human health. I think that medical anthropology traditionally focuses on human health, but from a biological or linguistic or cultural or social um, perspective. And what we've done here is brought the climate and the weather component into the study of medical anthropology. So I think we're augmenting that field of study by the type of work we do. And I can say from the perspective of a meteorologist that it's really been eye-opening to have an interdisciplinary collaboration like we do. Uh, in particular, I think as meteorologists, we tend to see problems from our perspective. And in, um, in terms of human health issues, you rapidly realize, particularly through field work, that, that there are really a lot of different drivers that can determine uh, a given human health outcome of which weather and climate are only one. Our group typically addresses maybe th what could be broadly characterized as three types of questions. Um, some of the questions are trying to gain a basic understanding of how uh, climate sensitive disease systems work. Other questions we address are really linked at developing decision support tools that can help um, aid um, stakeholders such as mosquito control personnel or public health decision makers in, in making their decisions. And the third type of questions we address are linked with how climate change may impact human health outcomes in the future. We often work on dengue fever, which is a mosquito-borne disease. Um, and so when we go out into the field, we're really collecting data on the mosquitoes, but also on the humans they bite, as well as the different types of ecological settings in which we find both the humans and the mosquitoes. So we collect immature mosquitoes, which is no easy task, let me tell you, when you have a little pipette and you're going from container to container, whether it's a tire or a bucket, and you're trying to take out larvae and pupae, it's very time consuming, but we also collect adult mosquitoes. And we like to talk to humans uh, in the field because we're interested in what they're doing to protect themselves from mosquito-borne diseases. So for example, do they have windows and doors that are screened? Do they wear repellent at the times of day when the mosquito's biting? Do they empty the standing water in which the mosquitoes lay their eggs? That type of thing. One of the questions we often receive is, will climate change make um, have adverse effects on human health. And I think for many of the problems that Mary and I uh, study, the answer is that climate change has the potential to exacerbate human health issues or to create more suitable conditions for disease transmission. So if it's warmer, it can go through more generations and you can get more mosquitoes. It also affects how long the adult mosquitoes live. It affects how quickly viruses can replicate. Um, how quickly they can incubate within the mosquito, the kind of efficiency with which it can transmit a virus. So lots of ways. Water through rainfall also provides habitats for mosquitoes. So numerous ways. And weather can also affect human behavior. It can make, uh, for example, in warm conditions, people might be outdoors more, or if it's rainy, they might be indoors more. So their exposure to disease vectors changes with the weather as well. But again, there are all of these other factors that we also have to consider uh, in the future, like how will human behavior change? How will socioeconomic conditions change? What types of changes in medical technology will occur? For example, will a vaccine for a given vector-borne disease be developed? So there are also other factors that could um, change the outcome, uh, future outcomes of human health in addition to climate. And I think one of the other things I was going to mention is um, an NSF-funded project uh, for which Andy was the, the PI. We found the mosquito Aedes aegypti at 2100 meters, so we were able to document it for the first time at that elevation in Mexico. And in this particular town where we found the mosquito, we had seen um, a 0.2 degrees Celsius rise in temperature uh, each decade for the past four decades. One of the interesting things we found is that there are no socioeconomic or other behavioral barriers to this mosquito being able to establish in those higher elevation areas. So, and that's important because up on the Altiplano, that's near Mexico City, where we have about 20 million people who currently are exposed to the viruses that this uh, mosquito transmits. Many of the hot spots that we see for vector-borne diseases today are in uh, low-income countries in um, where people's vulnerability is high and in tropical and subtropical areas where their exposure to disease vectors is also high. Uh, 
uh, in terms of where future hotspots might be, I think that's one of the questions that we're very interested in getting at. And um, while we might be able to kind of get at some of the um, future exposure issues, how exposure might change, we're having more difficulty answering how human vulnerability might change in the future. And I think even in some of the countries that we consider middle income countries, we see areas, we see pockets within those countries of poverty. And those are the areas where we um, have the most difficulty with vector-borne diseases because people have fewer resources to protect themselves. They don't necessarily have air conditioning. And we see this in the southern United States as well, that some of our poorest counties um, along the Texas-Mexico border, for example, are areas where we've seen repeated um, outbreaks of dengue fever. And uh, along those lines, this, with vector control or trying to keep the mosquitoes at bay, those uh, vector control agencies are often funded by taxes. And if you're in a, an area where the socioeconomic conditions are somewhat lower, you may have fewer resources to control mosquitoes as well. We've had uh, many different vector-borne diseases in the Americas for a long time. We had uh, yellow fever in Spanish Florida in the 1640s. There's a dengue outbreak in Philadelphia in the 1780s. And so uh, throughout much of the Americas, climate has been suitable for vector-borne diseases. And what we've seen in terms of, um, for example, uh, a contraction of vector-borne disease um, transmission in the United States has not been attributed to, to um, you know, kind of unsuitable climate. It's more improved socioeconomic conditions and people becoming less exposed to mosquito vectors over the years. So. Uh, this underscores how important it is when we look at the potential for climate change to, infect, to, to affect vector-borne diseases that we also look at human behavior on socioeconomic factors. We have a very unique program here at NCAR in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, whereby we bring in postdoctoral fellows for two years. And these fellows spend a year here at NCAR learning about our weather, climate, and health program and working on developing uh, climate models, and then they spend a year at CDC, uh, also working on modeling, but also learning more about epidemiology. So we feel that we have a unique cohort of fellows who've graduated from this program, and we'll have two more coming in shortly. But they're able to bridge that gap between uh, climate and health from both sides of the coin. So I think that the field will continue to be um, a healthy one as we move into the future. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah, that's true.